Hi all, Rick here once more. So Starfleet is also not considered a military in earnest, despite the fact it takes on the role of a space navy in defence for the Federation and others who request it. Despite the chain of command, uniform requirements, training and long list of similarities to such an organisation, they do go out of their wheelhouse often. Now, in certain times, the adherence to protocol and such is more apparent, like in the early to mid 2200s when Starfleet was still exploring the unknown and in the midst of the Dominion War. But during the middle of the 24th century, Starfleet was getting rather complacent in its exploration of space, so much so that ships like the Galaxy Class Cruiser had entire facilities dedicated to bringing families with the crew and supporting a civilian infrastructure. While no other class of vessel had the extensiveness of that flagship design at the time, it was not uncommon for there to be a non-Starfleet presence aboard which raises the question, why? For a start, let's take a look at the example I've already given, the families of the crews. Time aboard an exploratory craft is often a long haul affair. Subspace communications enable talk with families back home, but on the front lines of deep space exploration this is not always a given. Starfleet only expands its knowledge by pushing into the unknown, and that can bring one outside of the range of even their subspace networks. Add on to this that some vessels like the aforementioned Galaxy class were designed for long-term missions away from the heart of the UFP space, and there are going to be situations in which maintaining connections to a family back home becomes strained. So, in order to minimise the impact on the familial aspirations of a crew member, certain vessels that have adequate room allow for families to reside on a ship with them. It's a big ask for sure, and a personal one, to have your family accompany you aboard a ship for an extended voyage, and some do not embrace this offer, but the option is there. Then there are those specialists who might operate within the Federation, but who are not a part of Starfleet, such as Keiko O'Brien and her studies in botany. Such individuals are often afforded a permanent position on a vessel if that ship would benefit from their field of expertise, and they themselves required the access a starship would bring them. Starfleet often goes out of its way to establish ties and be aware of promising developments in multiple fields. And not every organisation, even among Federation worlds, is beholden to share their own technological research, so it's not uncommon for Starfleet to offer invitations or access to their fleet and facilities to external scientists, so that they might continue their research in the hopes of fostering cooperation. Think of the numerous times the Enterprise D was playing host to a visiting scientist, or a team from elsewhere in the hopes of drawing on the potential of their work and even sharing it in mutual gain. A large percentage of the civilian populace on a starship, therefore, is often made up of permanent or visiting researchers, scientists, archaeologists, or any academic field, really. They are there to make use of Starfleet, and Starfleet is hoping they'll share in return. Finally, the category I can think of are those who offer a role on the ship that is not covered by Starfleet training. Jobs that one might look at and claim to be mundane, next to an officer who catalogues unseen cultures on a daily basis, but I'd say no less necessary to maintaining a healthy lifestyle. For example, the barkeeps, barbers, therapists, both physical and mental, that all have roles aboard a ship to support the crew. Being able to finish your shift standing at ops for six hours before clocking off is made a lot more tolerable when you can go get a nice haircut and then unwind at a bar that is catered to by actual people rather than a talking wall panel. While Guinan and her staff on the Enterprise D might technically be considered non-crucial staff, I don't think anyone would argue that the Enterprise wouldn't have been slightly worse off if it didn't have them. This is not even covering the teachers of every level, professors, elementary school and in between, because with families on board come children, and somehow their education needs to proceed uninterrupted. Yet while the crew of a ship have their duties to attend and hobbies in their personal lives to keep engaged, what about those along for the ride? 
Those civilians that have an active role on the ship might not be a part of Starfleet structure, but they have their jobs and shifts. Teachers are in the classrooms every day educating young minds. The barbers have a revolving... sliding? door of people coming and going. Also, can we just draw attention to the fact that Mr. Mott of the Enterprise, the ship's barber, is a Bolian who likes to cut hair? Maybe because it's a foreign concept to his species? I've only just realised this and I love it. Anyway, back on topic. <clears throat> These people, despite not being a part of Starfleet, find themselves every bit as involved in running the ship as its crew. It's just for the most part, their expertise is not in ship maintenance, but people. Likewise, the visiting researchers are on a Starfleet ship to make use of their facilities and in many instances are probably assigned both a lab and personal quarters to make use of. This means that they were already here to do a job, to accomplish something, so that is going to be their primary focus. But what of the random person who has come aboard the vessel at the behest of their serving family? The husband who followed his wife after she got that career advancing promotion to a deep space nebula class. Doug is not a scientist or an engineer, so what does he do? Well, quite simply, there's no demand on him to do anything. As a Federation citizen on board a starship, his every necessity is provided for already, so he does not have to work a job. He could lounge around all day doing nothing, but that's both boring and not very in keeping with the Federation ideal. In a post-scarcity society, the primary motivation for people is not the acquisition of wealth, but simply self-betterment. Besides, if he's lucky, his job might be one that he can do from home, and if he can work from home, then he can do it from a starship with a subspace connection. Communications on and off starships are surprisingly open, sometimes for the detriment of the vessel, and there are of course restricted channels, but there is a lot of open com traffic around a starship. This would be muted when required, of course, however. Plus, on board a starship, depending on its size, there's always going to be something to do. While a random civilian might be denied if they were to volunteer for ship maintenance, would they really be denied in every position, both civilian and Starfleet? Several starships maintain gardens in botanical sections, and who keeps them tidy? Gardeners. Hell, Doug here could even become a gym rat helping out as a personal trainer on board. Why not? It's undeniable, I think, that being a civilian on board a starship means you'd have to make your own entertainment or find your own contribution, but the opportunity is there. It should be noted, however, that a non-Starfleet officer has limited access to certain critical areas. However, main engineering, the bridge, and other sensitive systems are off-limits to people just wandering in, and while anyone can make their way to these facilities, you'd be intercepted by a crew and asked if there was something the matter. If not there for a reason, you'd be escorted out. Ultimately, while a civilian did not have to abide by the ranking structure of Starfleet, the captain still had ultimate authority on who resided aboard their vessel, so it was wise not to annoy the crew. Considering that you have access to not only all these other facilities, but you also have the Federation database and a whole lot of specialists in their field on board, well, there's plenty of opportunity to expand your own interests. Take up hollow novel writing, visit stellar cartography to learn, talk with the dolphins, learn how to pilot a shuttle, and so on. In fact, when someone passes under the radar and chooses to do absolutely nothing for extended periods, it's often seen as a sign of something being wrong, and the exact opposite is encouraged. Another thing Starfleet would want to avoid is creating some form of class system on board between the crew who runs things and the civilians who tidy up after them. It's for this reason that the crew are responsible for cleaning the ship and the general upkeep of the vessel. That and they have the know-how in case they break something. Now don't get me wrong, as much as I'm trying to point out how much there is to do on a starship, even for a civilian life, it might not always gel with your life plans. For example, if you have a career on your colony planet and responsibilities there, you'll probably think twice before following your spouse to their deep space assignment, and your spouse will have more to consider about accepting such. That's a whole serious personal conversation to be had right there. The point is that in many instances, and whenever possible, Starfleet does its best to afford anyone serving or residing on a starship all the opportunities 
they would have otherwise. On the slow days, life aboard a large starship is barely different from life elsewhere. But of course, not every day is a slow day. With the mission profile of exploration, the unknown or hostile encounters are probable eventually. This can shake up the routine, and in red alert situations, the civilian crews are to report to designated safe spaces or remain in their quarters. Drills are a common thing on starships, and participation is mandatory for all aboard. They are to familiarise the crew with evacuation procedures, escape pod operations, crisis response and what else to do in emergencies should dire events unfold. So it's not for everyone, but being aboard a starship can offer some opportunities while doing its best to not get in the way of others and honestly only the individuals in question can answer if committing to a life aboard a starship is for them at all. For as many Keiko O'Briens that we see, who form their own life and career while on the Enterprise, there is a Mark Johnson who continued his own life while supporting his fiancée Catherine Janeway during her tenure as a captain. In this instance, Voyager's vanishing sort of shook things up, but it goes to show that all those people on board a Starfleet vessel were there because they chose to be so and were aware of the risks to themselves, but also the opportunities it offered. Thanks for watching this look into the civilian life aboard ship. And let me know what you'd do on board a, such a vessel, if not a serving soul aboard. I would probably want to host D&D nights in the holodeck as a hobby while writing stuff during the day. Thanks for watching. I've been Rick, and I'll see you later for another lore video. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>